report, man. Let's start right at the beginning at the, you know, the, the year you want to start at 2022, 2023, they all lead together. I think you got some macro versus micro info. And you said you went to an event at Hillsdale. Take it. And, and many, well, just, just to kind of summarize uh, in 2022, we know that, uh, well, obviously the rising interest rates, what's happened in the markets was um, a pretty big downturn and it wasn't as secure for those who are investing in fixed income investments in 2022 either. So many individuals who thought that, well, I'm going to have secure investments, I'm going to have my fixed income uh, portions of my portfolio, that's going to be my cushion because when markets aren't doing so bad, or are, are doing so well, if you will, the fixed income typically helps to protect the downside of a portfolio, reduce risk as it relates to it. So there was a shock to a lot of individuals at the end of 2022 when they see their fixed income portions of the portfolio being down 15 to 20%. And that was supposed to be the areas of protection when you had growth strategies which could be down 25 to 30 plus percent um, because the fixed income was supposed to be that cushion. Understanding that in uncertain times, growth would take more of a hit. The quickness of the Fed's raising rates really impacted both of those asset classes. The ones that basically did all right were value type strategies or deep value more specifically, which focus on higher dividend yields for specific stocks and companies, if you will. Those companies actually were flat to, to positive in 2022. Yet in 2023, those same strategies are down a little bit. Fixed income is down a little bit uh, into 2023. Growth strategies actually had a level of rebound where you have some growth strategies are up anywhere from 15 to 40%. We've had a pullback over these last two to three months. A lot of it is because we started, this comes, this is where the macro versus micro environment comes in. We're focusing so much on a macro overview of what's going on. What's the Fed going to say? What's the Fed going to do? We're not focusing on, well, how good is Apple? How good is Microsoft? How good is IBM? What's going on at the micro level with the businesses and what's progressing that we tend to focus at the macroeconomics globally that has been impacting the markets as a whole. And so that view, if you will, of where do we find good places for people to place new money? Because that's really the element to where strategies focusing on three, five, and seven years is where I have a greater emphasis when I'm looking for particular strategies. Reason why I look at three, five, and seven years, a full economic cycle has taken place. And so I want to see pretty similar performance in three, five, and seven years. That gives me an indication that the strategy may have had a uh, little volatility within that areas, but I'm also looking at other other factors such as well, one in, one in particular, and I always forget the name of it, but it's the Global Industry Classification Standards or the GICS, if you will. That is looking at where research is telling defensive stocks, defensive strategies, cyclical stocks, cyclical strategies, where are we allocating and what strategies are going to do better in growth environments and which Strategies are going to do better in volatile markets, which volatile, we want to be more defensive in growth environments. We want to be focused more on cyclical type companies or cyclical type strategies. So I started having a greater emphasis and placing a heavier weight in those categories to find asset managers that are already allocated to those particular areas. And that's floating up some areas of some asset managers that find themselves in that upper left-hand quadrant when you're comparing with an index. And what I mean by that upper left-hand quadrant, higher performance, less volatility or less risk. Keeping clients allocated to equities to generate the growth that is needed to outpace the higher inflation that we're finding ourselves in presently. Uh, so this way, when we have a greater level of return, we can peel off some funds depending on what their income stream or withdrawal rate needs to be in the years. So all of that's been good. That's why I love having you as our advisor, because it's like, I don't even sweat this stuff, man. I, I know you know what you're doing. And that's the whole point, everybody. That's the whole point of why you want to call Craig. I can't emphasize that enough because this stuff, you do not want to be a day trader. I guarantee you that is not a good path for success. All right there, pal. pal. Let's, uh, let's continue the conversation. Talking about fixed income, macro versus micro, where are we going now? Well, the point that I was even leading up to towards the end of the last segment was kind of giving a feel for what's been going on in the markets and uh, for a lot of clients who, if they're already in, in a, uh, an investment strategy, the focus on three, five, and seven years helps to remove the focus from the current volatility that we have experienced. So the institutional strategies that we've been implementing, emphasis being on three, five, and seven years, that's that longer term focus needs to stay in that focus, if you will, because any short term adjustment or adjustments made 
that's when, quite frankly, that's when you start jumping out of one portfolio that's dropped down and then you get into another portfolio that looked good historically. You get into it and then that one drops down going forward. This is we have to have faith and confidence in why are we selecting a portfolio strategy to begin with and make sure that if we do make any adjustments or changes, is there going to be a benefit going forward as it relates to the portfolios? Now, kind of the trifecta, for lack of a better term, um, that we see with new money coming in today, yields are higher, CD rates are higher, treasury notes are higher, money market funds are higher. So the yields being north of 5% makes it worthwhile for if a client's adding money to it and we anticipate funds to drop, that may make sense to do because if you're adding $100,000 to a portfolio, that's going to give you, right now, you could lock in five to $6,000 in income off a $100,000 investment that is rather low risk because you're going to get that money coming back. So you're seeing that in short duration type CDs, treasury notes, money market funds that are giving you good yield. We keep hearing higher for longer right now from the feds. Again, that macro view. So if it's going to be higher for longer, it may make sense to put money into a money market fund that is yielding five and between five and five and a half percent because that's providing you with daily liquidity. So new money can go into that areas. Secondly, if there's longer term views, um, the opportunity within dividend paying securities, even though dividend paying or value stocks held their own last year, they're down this year. They were down in 2020 for uh, quite a bit. They had some rebound in 2021. They helped to cushion a portfolio in 2022. Now in 2023, growth has had a lot of volatility. Value type strategies have dipped. In many cases, they're down anywhere from five to 7% year to date. Opportunity of being able to put new money into the, those types of value strategies. The opportunity there is increasing your yield on dividend stocks and then buying into stocks that are at a low having the opportunity for a longer term portfolio that's going to outpace performance relative to the fixed income investments that we talked about. And then thirdly, growth has had a level of volatility, more specifically in these last three months. So you've seen the peaks from July, um, the NASDAQ dropping 15 to 20% from the peak in July, uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average also dipping uh, into negative territory from its peak in July. Same thing for the S&P 500. So those who are looking for additional growth, adding money to a growth strategy also is another opportunity that we're seeing because growth also will perform well when we anticipate interest rates starting to go down, not staying flat. Because, I mean, the markets right now are, are basically they're kind of waffling today, down a little bit today as we're talking. Um, but yesterday, or excuse me, I, at the end of last week, they closed up because they saw that, again, the feds had their, their comments of, Hey, it looks like we're going to going to hold interest rates flat uh, or should say steady. We're not going to raise them anymore, but then had kind of a hawkish tone that if we see the numbers uh, for unemployment and everything else show that the economy is still rather strong, then we may consider raising the rates one more time before the end of the year. But right now, when the uh, unemployment rate came in lower than expected, you saw the markets jump, you know, one, one and a half percent the following day, which would lead to, I mean, it's, it's one of those situations where does it, bad news means good news. How can bad news, unemployment, be good news for the market? And that's where they start to focus on that macroeconomics and the impact of what um, the government has on uh, kind of the influence of borrowing costs and legacy costs that many of the firms and organizations may have. And if the feds kind of keep the, keep the interest rates stable, businesses can then make decisions, which is done at the micro level. And when they do that, then the focus is no longer at the macro level, the government level. It is now focused more at what businesses are going to be the most opportune during this environment we find ourselves in. So again, focusing on three, five, and seven years, what strategies have performed the best, that's always going to be fluctuating behind the scenes. But it helps me to like utilize industrial analytics. I use that to help me gauge what criteria is best, how important, uh, basically try to mirror or measure what research our research department is, is highlighting, but then how do I translate what they are suggesting into more of a, a technical evaluation of what I have to make a recommendation for clients.
So we get the fifth segment, so, but we're going to start off right here with the prognostication. Craig can kind of set this up. We got a minute and a half to go set it up so that people want to go get the podcast. If, if they want to hear your prognostication for 2023, 2024, end of 2023 and the beginning of 2024 and the whole year, go ahead, Craig. It, well, 2024 isn't going to be, I mean, my, my thoughts on 2024 isn't, isn't going to be too different than that of 2023, because a lot of the things that they do today, especially with new money is going to go through 2024. So if they're able to get some, um, some basically some CDs or or anything along those lines, you can ex actually extend that out through 2024. So that's going to provide with uh, opportunities for solid income, low risk investment. That's going to give them some yield if they don't want to deal with some areas of volatility. It is an election. Year. And so the elections are, again, the macro view of what's going on, how policy changes is going to impact some of the markets going forward. So depending on what those policies are going to be, um, will dictate whether or not we continue on with the macro view of our economy, or if there's going to be policy changes that's going to shift and we're going to start having to look more at the micro view, start being looking at more local, more business oriented. That dynamic and expectations of 2024, that is going to be kind of what our expectations are going to be. We do, we do think we're going to have more growth. The question is how much? We've seen some growth take place um, this year. The growth strategies have outperformed. We've seen a pullback again over the last three, four months. And then uh, we anticipate that we're going to have kind of growth heading out of this year and then continue on into 2020. So that opportunity for uh, new money coming in, I would more than likely be focusing on some growth strategies that may be <laughs> kind of in defensive sectors. So um, yeah, to, to get more information on that, I'd be more than happy to take some phone calls at, to be able to get into some details and whatnot. So yeah, so our, our expectations for 2024 continue on with the volatility within the markets because it is an election year. And if you don't want to have that level of volatility and you got new money coming in, I would suggest probably putting that into some fixed income, maybe some money market funds that are giving you the higher yields that you can get out of when interest rates, we anticipate interest rates to start to drop. And I think the feds mentioned that they were planning on four drops next year. I think they've cut it down to two. So. 